This is Ed Rep Radio, presented by Eastman Music Company. This is Ed Rep Radio, a podcast to bring you ideas and information from industry experts you can use on the road every day. Presented by Eastman Music Company, and I'm your host, Shane Duell. On this episode, we are talking with Charlie Mangini, someone who I know you will very much enjoy hearing from today. Mr. Mangini comes from decades of experience as a band director, teacher of future band directors, and president of Vandercook College in Chicago. You will hear all sorts of great information and ideas on how Ed Reps helped him in the band room and what they meant to him as a band director. Charlie McGinney, thank you for joining us. What a pleasure, Shane. Thank you for having me. I look forward to it. We're talking to uh, one of my very favorite group of people in the world, man, uh, road reps for for music stores, man. They They are like the mortar that hold all the bricks together in this deal. You know what I'm saying? Mm, I'm sure they'd love to hear that. Uh, so why are they your favorite people? Oh, because they're like uh, they're like the American Red Cross for band directors and orchestra directors. <laughs> I mean, they're, you know, I mean, band directors, let's face it, most of them need a road map uh, so they know how to get home at night. I mean, they can't they can't figure that out. Right. And and they uh, and and if if they were Noah, uh, they would all have drowned because they don't plan ahead. Usually most of the time. So so there's always these crises that come up. And, and, and they got to turn to somebody. And if they've got a great relationship with the road rep, guess what? They got that road rep on speed dial and that's the first call that they make. So they just love them because you know what, they're there to, they're there to solve problems and they take care of them and they make them feel good. And they let them know that, you know, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. So just Mm. love them, love them to death. Well, obviously you've had some experience with road reps. Can you walk us through your career in music and let everybody know uh, where you started and where you are today? Absolutely. I, I started, uh, I got my, my bachelor's degree at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri back in 1976. And I had a really good relationship at that time with uh, the local music dealer there uh, was Missouri Band Instrument Company. Russ Chambers was his name. And, and I'll even go back before that time. I was a freshman in college and there was a Catholic school in the neighborhood. And I actually started a beginning band program at this Catholic school as a freshman in college. I had a couple of classmates. One was a percussionist and one was a woodwind player. And they did the percussion and woodwind beginners. And I did that. And we worked with a guy in Nagani, Michigan, a little town in the hmm. upper peninsula of Michigan, John Violetta, Violetta's music. And he was the first dealer that I ever had a, a relationship with that really kind of helped me get going. And of course, I was a freshman in college. So, hmm. so fast forward then uh, a whole bunch of years. And then I didn't have a a music dealer in my first job. I took a job at at Winnetonka High School in North Kansas City, Missouri. It was a big Hmm. school, 1,800 kids in the high school, and the band program was was big, and, and... uh, but we really didn't, there was no dealer that called on us on a regular basis. And I was, I was, I had, I learned some things about, about, you know, music and music dealers and what they could help, but I didn't learn the rest of the story, you know? So uh, I remember I needed a baritone saxophone. And I went to my principal and I said, hey, I got a kid that's a great baritone saxophone player, but our baritone saxophone is just, it's, it's junk. It's, it can't get be repaired. It's, it just plays out of tune and all that. I said, you got to give me a baritone saxophone. He said, well, put it down in writing. And so I, so I wrote down, I said, I requisition a baritone saxophone. So about three weeks later, this guy who I'd never met before walks into my band room. He's got a cardboard box. And, and I don't know who he is. And he says, I got something here for you. And I'm okay. And he kind of introduced himself. And I opened up the box. He said, I got a baritone saxophone. There was no case. There was no <sighs> uh, mouthpiece. There was no neck strap. There was no nothing. There was a baritone saxophone and a neck and a bunch of packing peanuts. Uh-huh. And, and, uh, and I said, well, where's the case? He said, I don't know. And I said, well, where's the, where's the mouthpiece? I don't know. So I went back to my principal, and, and he said, well, uh, I don't know. We'll have to get a hold of the, the, the guy that did the bidding for the district. And called him, and he said, well, I just bid a baritone saxophone. There was no other, nothing else uh, that, that you asked for, so that's all I got. And I learned that that day that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. 
And, <laughs> and as, I, as I went a little bit farther down the road and I met a, a music dealer, a guy by the name of Wes Knowles, who, who was a music dealer in the Kansas City area and became just a dear friend of mine. And he kind of worked me through this. And, and I come to find out that, that, you know, that that road rep, man, that, that was the guy that was kind of like helping me plan what I needed to purchase and how I needed to write my bid specs and all that sort of stuff. So ever since that day, man, I've held my music dealers close, you know. Mm. And, and I taught for nine years at, at the first school. Then I went to a school in Kansas. And the local music dealer was Max Green of Funk's Music Center. And, right. and I was there for nine years. And then I moved to Chicago, where I spent 23 years at Vandercook College of Music. And my local music dealer was George Quinlan. And, and all three of those people were just fantastic. And they just made such a difference in all the things I did. So uh, that's what I did. I taught for 41 years. And now I'm not teaching. I'm retired. Hmm. At Vandercook College, Vandercook is, is a, a school for teachers, correct? For future music educators. Right. We teach people to be music teachers. I mean, you know, the educators side of this says, you know, it's a, well, we don't want to talk it like this, but it's really a trade school to become a music teacher. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And we do mm -hmm. it. We, I think we do it better than anybody else. I mean, because kids learn everything. They learn how to play all the instruments. They learn how to teach all the instruments. They even have a class in repair, you know, for, for those emergency Great. repairs at, at Vandercook. Uh, which is something that I'd never had in my undergraduate. But uh, but yeah, no, it's a great school. And I was there for, like I say, 23 years. And um, uh, I was president the last 13. All right, great. So between your time as a teacher and your time teaching teachers, future teachers, I should say, I'm sure you've seen all sorts of different challenges that, that band directors have to face in the classroom. And what I'd like to dig into is what those challenges are that that maybe an ed rep could help solve and some of the most important ones that an ed rep can really kind of make or break the day for a, for a band director. What were some of those challenges? Oh boy, that's a great question. Uh, that's a very good question. Well, you know, the biggest challenge that many directors have is that they're isolated. They, hmm. they work alone. They don't have a colleague. They don't have anything to bounce ideas off of or to share frustrations with or anything like that. So, you know, I think the number one role <laughs> of the of the road rep many times, I mean, they, too bad they can't bring a couch with them when they go in and visit the <laughs> band director. And they go in and go, okay, lay down for 20 minutes here and talk to me. And then, you know, we'll kind of solve all your problems. Because because in many times they act as a therapist for the director. I mean, the, the, huh. the director, you know, he, he needs to know how to handle a problem with an administrator, how to handle a problem with a colleague. He's trying to figure out, man, I need to get some new equipment, and uh, I'm not sure how I should approach this with my administrator. So I, I don't think it's any one problem, but they just don't have a friend. And I think mm. in many cases, the road rep becomes a real friend to the, to the music dealer, you know, they become somebody that they can trust. There's, there's everything. There's, there's dealing with parent issues. It's communicating. When you get into the younger ones, it's recruitment and retention, mm. man. And, and it's, it's always budget. You know, we're always looking for more money and for budget. We want to get more and, and better equipment and better instruments and all of those kinds of things. So I think there's not one thing that road reps can do, but it's, it's just so varied you know, and to kind of go in. And, and I think the best road reps are the ones that ask the most questions. Hmm. You know, they, they let the other, they let the director talk. They just ask him questions and feed him questions and kind of, and kind of work for him. And I think, you know, it's, it's interesting when you have a conversation with somebody. I got, I got a dear friend in the business, Tim Lotzenheiser. Well, I know a lot of people know Tim and Tim mm -hmm. was my college band director, and we kind of joke about this, and <laughs> and it's like we're to the point now where, you know, when you see somebody, you ask them questions, and they get to talk about their favorite subject, which is themselves, right? right? Kind of like I'm doing right now. Uh, you know, you talk about your favorite subject, and then at the end of that, they get done, they're like, man, I just had the best conversation with so-and-so. <laughs> well, hell, it wasn't a conversation. You did all the talking, you know? And I think a lot of that's true with, with, uh, with road reps when they go in and talk to the, to the band director, you know? If, if the road rep asks questions and shows interest and f does some follow-up questions and kind of guides them along, they end that, and that, man, the director just feels 10 feet tall because they've just mm. had this great conversation with, 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 with the ed rep, you know? Uh, so what I'm hearing is an ed rep needs to be a fantastic listener. 
Well, that's I think so. Yeah, they need to be a fantastic listener, and they and they need to be. You know, there's there's a certain point in every uh, conversation where you can inject a little bit of something, and it takes hold. You know, mm-hmm. I, I always say that there's there's three things that people want. People want affirmation, then they want inspiration, and then they want information and they want it in hmm. that order so if you can go in and affirm that the guy's doing a great job and his band sounds good and really like it and you know we, we always got to find something positive to say whether the you know you like the bulletin board or man i, I like the way you got the chairs or you know the, the I, I was listening i heard the band playing when i came in sound good you know things are good i saw some kids in the hallway they were just upbeat i asked them how band was going and they said man it's just we're having a good time and the band's playing well or i mean Means something, something to affirm that what that guy's doing is doing a good job, and then and then you work to inspire them. You know, you let them know that you care and and that they're mm-hmm. important. And then once you get them to that point, man, man, you can lead them anywhere you need to lead them. Hmm, that's great advice. Thank you. Going back to when you were a teacher, uh, what were some of the things that ed reps would offer you in terms of service? And uh, it sounds like being a great listener is number one. And then once we get to that that information part and what you're just talking about, when when ed reps can start interacting with you on a kind of a business side of things, what were some of the services that you found really important uh, that they would offer you that would help your life as a teacher? Well, obviously, you know the the one of the big ones that everybody faces is is those instrument repairs. I mean, just you know, we got an instrument that's the kid comes up after class and this is broken or that pad fell out or this spring, whatever, or the valve is stuck or something. And, and so there's always that need for those emergency repairs. And I think that's a given. I think that's, that's, you know, that's a big one, but you know, you start talking about how the band's doing and what are you playing? And, 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 you know, the ed reps that have been band directors, those ed reps that have a history of being in band have a leg up on the guys that don't, because in many cases, they know a lot of the repertoire. They know a lot okay. of the things that yeah. are going on. They know how to talk band talk or orchestra talk with that director that's there. And that's really, really important. I remember a case in point when at my very first job and this Wes Knowles came in and we were playing and we were talking and I said, man, I just, I said, I just don't like the sound of my clarinets. And he, and he goes, well, what are they playing on? I said, oh, they're playing on pieces of crap. You know, they got some, <laughs> they got some old, you know, Bundys and things that they're just, and they're all falling apart. I says, they just, the horns just don't work. And he says, well, what about if we found a way to get you all suited up with, with a new section of clarinets? And I said, well, <laughs> how would we do that? And he said, well, how are your boosters doing? I said, well, my boosters are doing great. And I had boosters that raised so much money, it was just ridiculous. You know, and he said, well, he said, uh, well, how about if I cut you a deal on a, on a, like on like ten brand new clarinets for the school? I go, well, how are we going to do that? Eh, I can cut you a deal. So anyhow, he kind of worked with me and worked with the boosters, and guess what? We had ten brand new clarinets for for hmm. for the school band, you know. And all of a sudden, those kids felt like wow, ten feet tall, and the, they started to sound better, and they weren't having the problems, and their their tone quality was better, and all that. But what what he did was he was again he was a good listener, and he. He asked the right question, and when I came up with the problem, he offered me a solution. And as a young hmm. director, I said, well, let's pursue that solution because that, that's a good solution, you know? And, and so, I mean, sometimes it's going to be something to the, to the effect of, man, this is the 15th time I've picked up this euphonium. It's about time you get a new one, you know? And you, mm-hmm. I mean, you can't say it to him like that, but like, hey, you understand that, don't you, that the, this instrument, you really need to start looking to replace this thing because we just can't repair it anymore. And, and I think directors sometimes don't think about that or they don't know, well, how am I going to approach my principal on that, you know? And, and to be able to set up something where it says, hey, look, you know, this instrument was purchased 15 years ago. The district has depreciated it down to zero. So it really has no value. And now we're spending, you know, we're spending 75 to 100 to 150 dollars four times a year to get this thing just in playing condition. We're just wasting taxpayer money on this, right? And so mm-hmm. I think I think that's a that's just a, another way to, to kind of help directors think about some other things about getting the instruments 
replaced and getting better instruments because I think that's a real challenge that directors would like that but they don't know how to approach it mm. on the topic of instruments uh, e- equipment in general that's something that obviously music stores sell a big part of their life is supplying equipment when it came time to buy an instrument for the school what kind of qualities would you look for in the instrument itself um, what did you need out of an instrument well, I needed something that was going to going to withstand the test of time. You know, it was going to going to going to work out. Many times, I mean, I'm a trumpet player, so you give me a trumpet, I'll play it. I'll, you know, I can I can kind of work my way around a horn and a trombone, and maybe a little bit on uh, on tuba, not much, but you know, phonium. But what I would do is I would I would call some people in the area, maybe private lesson teachers, and I'd have them play it. I'd have them play hmm. the instrument and tell me, you know, what, what they like, what they don't like about it. And, and I would also try to get some instruments in the hands of kids. And I want the kids to know what they, what they like about it, what they didn't like about it. How did it feel? How did it blow? How did it play? Because in the end, they're the, going to be the ones that are going to be using those instruments. Mm-hmm. So, I th- you know, I think you want, obviously, you want the best quality you can get. You want something that's that's gonna gonna take the take the the dings and the taps and all that sort of stuff that's gonna happen with day to day work and a school kid on a on an instrument and and I think I think you want a good value for the money, you know and mm. I, I think I think that, uh, because we, you know nobody's got so much money that they can you know buy a Bentley trumpet you know I mean there's just <laughs> I mean, they, they just can't. So they're always looking for the, for the instrument that's going to give them the best value for the dollar, you know. Okay. And manufacturing and the whole music industry has come, come so far. I mean, your company, Eastman, my God, the, the strides that you guys have made in the last 10 years are unbelievable, <laughs> right? I mean, it really is. But we Thanks, don't, Charlie. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's, it's the absolute truth. I've played some of your instruments. I've, I've talked to some professional players. For instance, your tuba. You got a new. You guys got a new tuba out that's like killer, and it's like several thousand dollars cheaper than anything else on the market. And from what I'm hearing, it's better. I mean, I I ran into the principal tuba from the Indianapolis Symphony one day, and hmm. and we started talking, and he was just going on and on about the Eastman tuba. Gene Picorni of the Chicago Symphony loves the Eastman tuba. So when you get the best tuba players in the world talking about the quality of the Eastman tuba, and then this tuba is available for schools to buy. I mean, we got to take a look at that. Now, there's some other names out there that when you say, oh, give me the best name of this and the best name of that, it's it's like it falls off their tongue because only they've heard it so long. It's like saying, you know, well, what's the best hamburger in the world? You go like, well, well McDonald's. No, that's because hmm. you've heard McDonald's advertise it more than anybody else. It's certainly not the best hamburger in the world. Not that it's bad, <laughs> but it's not the best, right? And I think the sure. same thing is true with instruments. So unless music teachers have experienced those other brands and have experienced the quality that they can get and the value that they can get for it, I think sometimes they miss the boat. I think sometimes they just default to brand X because that's what they know. That's what they, mm, that's what they sure. told, you know, that's what they grew up with. That's what they had when they were a kid. I mean, we, we only know what we know, you know? And, and right. so, you know, you get back to it. I mean, one of the cool <laughs> things that I remember Max Green, when I was in, in Olathe, Kansas, used to do every once in a while, and it was brilliant on his part, was that he would bring an instrument over. And he'd go, hey, Charlie, he said, I just met with the rep from this company, and they got a brand new model of this clarinet or the this trumpet or this trombone or whatever. And he says, uh, you know, I want to get your opinion on it. He says, because, you know, I just want to know if this is something we should stock. He said, so would you, would you like hmm. let the kids in the band play this for a week or two? And I said, sure, Max. So, you know, so here I'm standing in front of the high school band, and, and I go, and by the way, trombones, um, I, I need to see after class or the trumpets or whatever. They come up and go, like, hey, listen, the, w- there's a brand new instrument that Mr. Green brought over from the music store, and he wants us to try it, and he wants you to take some notes on if you like it or not or what you like about it. So th- mm-hmm. for the next week or two, I said, would you play it every day and, and just kind of trade it off? And, man, they, they thought they were important. Well, they were important, but it was a big deal to them, you know? And, hmm. and uh, they got done, and then they would give me their report, and we'd pass it back to the music dealer. And guess what? All of a sudden, kids started buying new instruments. And I'm going like, whoa. There was a, <laughs> there was a great fallout to that. 
you know, hey, I want your help. I want your opinion. I need some help on that. And it was just a, a great way to put a better instrument in a lot of kids' hands. And, and, you know, all it takes is like one or two to do that. And then all of a sudden, the dominoes start falling. So it's like the instrument sold itself. You just had to put it in the kids' hands. Yeah. And it, well, especially if it's a good instrument, you know, and it's, right. it's working good and they got good action and it feels good to the kid. And, you know, I mean, most of the time, those... Those brass players, you know, I mean, those brass instruments probably that some of those kids played haven't been cleaned out in 20 years, you know. I mean, if, mm-hmm. you, if you got the old snake and the brush and you went down the bell, you'd probably find like a Pepsi bottle and a ham and cheese sandwich or something like that down there somewhere. But, you know, so, I mean, the, but the instrument's going to play better and it's probably mm-hmm. going to play more in tune and all the slides are going to work and everything's going to be great and it's going to... You know, it's going to inspire. It's like driving a car, right? You go to the car lot and you're looking for a new car, and a guy goes, "Well, take this one for a test drive, will you?" And you start driving, like, "Man, this is cool." And look at the features here, man. This is. I think we can afford this. What do you think, honey? Oh yeah, sure. Guess what? You buy a new car. Same right, same thing right. is true. Same thing is true. I think when you're doing an instrument. So let's say there's an ed rep out there who wants to try this with a teacher, a customer of theirs, and and the teacher is a little hesitant to to put. Let's say they're step-up instruments that the the ad rep wants to bring out into a classroom. Yep. And the teacher is a little hesitant. What's something that an an, an ad rep could remind a band director? Why is it important for step-ups to be in their band? What benefit does it have musically for your ensemble? Yeah. You know, I know what you're saying when you talk a step-up. And I never never wanted to call instruments step-up instruments when Hmm. when I was teaching. Because that Im- what did you call them? that almost implied that there was a middle ground, right? Hmm. I, there was the, there was the beginner level, and then there was the perf- I always called them performance quality. I like Be- that because now you know you're getting into advanced junior high or middle school. You're getting to high school. You're doing a lot more performances now. We're all of a sudden starting to go to festivals, and we're starting to to have more public performances. And and you know so so the the horn has better features. It has better response. You know it it blows free or it has a better tone quality. Um, uh, and all of those kinds of things. So I like to always call it performance quality. And and one of the ideas I had was, you know, many teachers, you know, you're having a concert. So what do you got to do? Okay, kids, the concert is at 7.30 tonight. I need you here at 6.30 for the warm-up. So 6.30, mm-hmm. guess what? So now mom and dad has to bring the kid over. I mean, most of those kids don't drive. Somebody's got to bring the kid over. Or somebody has to arrange to get brought over. They drop them off at 6.30, and then the parents or the whatever goes back home. Sometimes they come back to the concert, and sometimes they don't. And I thought, hmm. So I always thought that'd be a great time to have a coffee and cookies for parents, you know, hmm. an hour before the concert. And, and arrange with the director and say, hey, you know, look, look, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to just provide coffee and punch and cookies and stuff for the parents. And they bring the kids. They can go and have a little social time before the concert, not after the concert. Because after the concert, everybody wants to go home. They don't want to stick mm-hmm. around and waste right. time. And they right. want to get their kid and get out of there. But before that, there's, there's time to kill. So rather than have them sit in the auditorium, let's, you know, take over the choir room or the commons or something like that. And then when they do that, Put up just a little instrument displays, you know, like cookies and coffee tonight are being presented by ABC Music Company, you know, mm. and and you got a few instruments just sitting out there and they just sit there. They're just like decorations. It's just a backdrop to the scene and your parents there and you're talking to the parents and you introduce yourself and they introduce themselves one of their students play. And, and when you're not talking to the parents, those parents are looking around because there's instruments there and they're shiny and they want to go around and see what they look like. And all of a sudden, you know, it's, they, they get the idea that, hmm, this would be a, hmm. how much does this cost? Well, now, what is this different? You know, is, how is this different than what my son has? Well, guess what? You've just, right. you just opened up the conversation. And you're, right. and you're on the way to getting that child a new instrument, you know. So I think that's, that's, a, that's another way to do it. Uh, because, like you said, some directors don't want to give up the rehearsal time to hmm. have a, a, a rep come in and show kids, uh, you know, performance quality or step up, step up instruments to their kids. They got, you know, they don't even have time to teach music, man. They got concerts they got to get ready for, especially right. when we get out of this COVID thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Did you spend much time with parents educating them on on why their student would need to get a better instrument did did you have a lot of pushback from parents saying well i just got him one a few years ago when he started band why do i need a better one did you spend much time well i guess teaching the the, the parents why why they should do this we we talked a little bit about it we had we had a very organized 
uh, parents group and we had organized meetings and all that sort of thing. And, and I, I did two things. Number one is I, I had a weekly newsletter that I wrote um, for my band students. And I would encourage them to take it home to the parents. And it was like the old Paul Harvey news and comment. I mean, there was hmm. there was Paul Harvey. Yeah, I haven't heard that name in a while. Oh yeah, you know, because Paul Harvey was news and comment, right? And mm-hmm. you, you talk about the news, about the things that are, you know, you, we have a sectional this night, or there's a concert this time, and those are facts. And then you inject in there some philosophy. You inject hmm. in there, you know, uh, little statements. And and in those statements, you can talk about the importance of making sure that your instrument is in great condition. I mean, even, for instance, let's take a look at a trumpet. You know, you got your trumpet from your from your grandfather, and even though that instrument may look great, what you can't see is what's going on inside that instrument, and it's called mm. red rot. And, and right. so brass instruments rot from the inside out. And even though it's shiny and good, guess what? In the inside, it's corroding. It's kind of like cancer in the body. You, mm. you know, you don't see it, but it's there, and it's, it's causing a problem. What's the problem? Well, when that air comes through and that air hits that part of that metal that just isn't isn't smooth and isn't there, it starts mm-hmm. interrupting the airflow and it starts to distort the tone and you don't have a smooth and so you start in you start talking to them about that, you know? You start talking to them about uh, the fact that, you know, when was the last time uh, you had your child's clarinet adjusted uh, pad height or put new pads on it? Uh, directors need to inform their students about that. So I did that on a mm-hmm. weekly bo- a weekly newsletter, and then mm. I had a monthly uh, newsletter that I sent out to all the parents. And, of course, you can put articles and information in there. Um, right. And one of the things we did uh, when I was in the Olathe, uh, Kansas Public School District, was that uh, and we, we were dealing with a situation where we had um, one primary music dealer. And there were a couple of ancillary music dealers that were trying to horn in on the school. And I'm sure road reps that are listening to this conversation have that, right? So Mm -hmm. what we did was we took our primary music dealer and we asked them the brands and the models they had. We had them bring them in. We tried them. And then we put together a recommended list of instruments for our beginners. And we would have three or four models. And we made sure that on that list we had instruments from from our primary dealer, and then every, you know, there were some instruments from our ancillary dealers also. And then what we told them, we told our teachers, was, you know, this is the list. And, of course, if there's three things on the list and the parent comes up after, the parent's going to say, well, I see you have three trumpets or three flutes on the list. Which one do you recommend? And now Hmm. now we have to deal with that question, right, in a professional way. And the response was, well, you know, I haven't had any experience with this model or this model, but I I do have some students that have this model and they really like it and they really uh, think it's playing pretty well. And you know what? They've not had any repair issues. And it's so, you know, if it were me, that's what I'd probably look at. But I think all three are good. And I don't think you could go wrong with any of them. Well, guess what? The parents are going to go with the ones that you just said, you know, you've got some experience with. And it's a, right because it's, they trust you. They trust you, right? Exactly, and it's a nice way to direct their thinking to get them to get the instrument that you want. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to dig into. You just mentioned you had basically a, a primary music store, a primary vendor you would use. What were the qualities of that music store versus maybe some of the other ones that were available? Well, number one, they've built a relationship. And you can trust them. You can take Hmm. their word to the bank. Hmm. You know, they are there for you when you're not expecting them to be there for you. They're not just Hmm. there to to make the sale and run. They They take a genuine interest. When you have a concert and they can make it, they're at the concert. When they know there's a festival day and they can they can make the festival, they're at the festival. I, I, I remember I was talking about Max Green at Olathe Music Center, and and I this I remember this like it was yesterday. Uh, we're getting ready to go on to play the state contest in large group ensemble. We're playing Lincoln Sherposey. My Great. my principal clarinet player drops her mouthpiece and cracks it. 
No. Five minutes before we're supposed to go oh. on to play, Link, play, play the concert, right? This wow. girl is a mess. I'm sure. Max Green was in the audience, and I went over to Max, and I told him, he says, oh, I think I got a clarinet mouthpiece in the car. <laughs> and he went out, and he just so happened to have a clarinet mouthpiece, and he brought it in, and the girl was able to, to get through it. I mean, it wasn't the one that she had been playing on forever, but guess what? He saved the day. He was, that, mm. he was a knight in shining armor, you know? Right. So I, I think what, when we look to those dealers, I think they're reputable, and I think then they show support in other ways. So oftentimes we hit up our music dealer for support in one way. I mean, everybody gets the the, the obligatory music folder, right? The, mm-hmm, the, and, mm-hmm. and those things cost dealers a lot of money. People don't understand do. how expensive those things are. But, but, you know, they're always generous to a fault there. If there's an activity coming up, they support the activity. They have good product. They take care of the kids. Uh, they show a genuine interest. And, and uh, so, again, it's the relationship building. It's how they, how they interact with you. You know, they're, they're just not hmm. there to, to one and done kind of thing. Right. So a music store has several different departments within the store. You have the repair shop. You have the instruments, the sales and rentals. You have the accessories department. Uh, you have sheet music. Is there any one of those departments that will make or break whether you decide to support that store or not? Well, I think, I think a lot of it is, um, is probably centered around repair. I think the, mm. the repair people have to be good. Now, I know another case, and I had a, one of my former students from Vandercook. I mean, I'm retired now, but I still get calls from those people. And they had a situation that was really, uh, really kind of odd. They had a student who, against the director's discretion, the music dealer, rented the student a bass clarinet. Okay. Okay, you with me? Mm -hmm. The director said, please don't rent this child a bass clarinet. Uh, You know, let's go with a regular clarinet. I don't know. I don't know all the particulars of it. Anyhow, uh, the student stopped making payments on it. Hmm. Now he needs to get the, the instrument repossessed, right? Yeah, always an awkward situation. So, oh, it's, it's crazy. I, that's one of the things I would never want to do. So the dealer went to the principal demanding that the principal get the instrument back for the dealer. And, and, hmm. and of course, then the principal, where does he go? He goes to the band director, right? Right. And he came down on the band director, and the band director goes, but I told the guy not to do it in the first place, and I just... One, and and he so he tried to work with the guy and the guy was just adamant that that you know well, you're going to be responsible for it because that kid's in your band and I mean he just started this whole smoke screen with it well guess what that that dealer is no longer welcome in that guy's school mm, right burned a bridge yeah it sounds we, like. he burned he burned a major bridge right there mm. so I think you know it again it all boils down to communication it just comes back to developing that relationship and just finding ways you know just uh, any anything that they can do for it so let's look at the the role of the ed rep in a band program and let's say um, let's say you have multiple ed reps like you had multiple music stores to choose from and you you needed to choose one ed rep to be your primary rep that you would was your go-to person mm-hmm. what sort of qualities would that ed rep possess that maybe the other ones didn't they would, they would really, again, they would want to take a sincere interest in the program. They'd want to know how I'm doing. They'd want to know how the, you know, what things we have coming up. Uh, they'd, they'd help me look ahead. They'd help me do some planning. It would be less, it would be less I, me, you know, mm-hmm. that, that when the ed rep, when the ed rep comes in and they talk about all the things that they're great at or what they did or when they were teaching well i used to do this and i did that and i i was this and well and you know what i would do if i were you i don't care what you would do if you were me you know you're (laughs) not me right and i think i think the ed rep that probably uses the fewest number of i's and me's will probably win in the in the long run you know i think being a good communicator and again taking a genuine interest in, in what they're doing. There was a, a guy that used to work for back when United Musical Instruments was going on. And, you know, there was the King and the Con reps, right? 
and the mm-hmm. and the and the con rep in the Kansas City area. This is the this is your like like in your company. You're the district manager mm-hmm. of the instrument company. It was a guy by the name of Charlie Molina. Charlie okay. Molina was a legend in the music industry. I mean, this guy was amazing. And you know what? Every once in a while, Charlie would come by my school and just sit in the room and listen to band rehearsal. Hmm. He says, well, what are you doing? I said, I just wanted to come by and hear the band today. And that's it. And get done. He just put a big smile on his face. And he go, man, they were really getting better. I really like it. Thanks for letting mm-hmm. me come. That's it. There was no other thing. Out the door you go. Max Green, that guy, did the same thing. You know, when I was in Chicago, George Quinlan would come by. He'd just come in and smile in the back and listen to the band for 10, 15 minutes, and he'd wave, and off he'd go, right? I mean, so I think that I'm taking an interest in you is is another huge thing of of way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not selling anything. I'm just setting it up for, for, for when I need something, right? When I think about it, I have to think about them. It's whose mm-hmm. name comes to mind first, and that's the one I'm going to call, right? If I have a good relationship right. with them, right? So it's anything, anything you can do to to do that, right? Good stuff, Charlie. What else? What other advice would you give in EdRep to to build that relationship you're talking about, being a good listener and communicator? Is there is there any other advice? I think something that a person that's usually left out of the equation a lot of times is the administrator and in, in large hmm. large districts there's a there's probably a music supervisor but in the buildings you know there's a principal or an assistant principal or something like that and i think it would be really great if every director would take the ed rep up and introduce him to the principal you know hmm. or if the ed rep would say hey would you introduce me to your principal i've never met him i've heard good things about him heard good things about her i would really like to meet her and you and you meet the you meet the principal and you just say, hey, I'm so and so, and I work with the, you know, I work with the band program here, I work with the orchestra program here, and I want you to know, I, I call on a lot of schools. I mean, I really call on a lot of schools, and I'm always impressed when I come in here. The building looks neat, hmm. it's clean, thing, things are orderly. I mean, you must have a great uh, a great custodial staff here because the building looks really really good. It doesn't look run down. I walk into the band room. The students are happy. They're smiling. They make me feel good. I feel welcome here. You know what? I just wanted you to know it's a, it's really a pleasure for me to work with this school. If I come by, I might, I might stop by and just, just to wave and say hi. I've created a relationship with that administrator, and guess what? I've made that administrator feel good, and I've made the director feel good. I've made everybody feel good in the process, right, which is right. part of what we're trying to do when we build relationships, right? I was at my second school. Uh, I wore a blazer every day when I taught, a navy blue okay. blazer because it was this. It had the school crest on it, and I wore I wore a blazer every day to work. And in the pocket of my blazer, I always had a pocket full of Jolly Ranchers, and and so um, I would come up and I, and as I would go through the hall to check my mail, I'd leave a Jolly Rancher on the desk of the secretaries, right? And then I would walk around Smart. the corner. And I would leave a Jolly Rancher at, at, we had four guidance counselors, and I left them a Jolly Rancher on every, with every guidance counselor, and I walked back. It, it was like, I don't know, eight, nine Jolly Ranchers a day it cost me, right? <laughs> and I didn't do it every day, but I did it a lot of days, right? And it got to the point with the guidance counselors that when I would come up and they would hear me talking to somebody, if they were on the phone, they would slide their doors, their chairs to the door, and they would just stick their hand out so they could get the piece <laughs> of candy, right? Well, you had them trained. Yeah, I had them trained. But I also had people along the way, that other salesmen that would call on me. There was one guy in particular, Bud Bradley. Bud was a uniform salesman for Demolin Band Uniforms. Okay. And every time I got a note or a letter from Bud, there was a business card in it. And he always told me, he says, Charlie, that business card is the silent salesman. And, you know, hmm. nobody throws a business card away. I mean, so I, every time I would pull out a desk drawer, there'd be a card from Bud Bradley in there. I mean, I'd see it all the time. And I thought, that's a great idea. So what I would do sometimes, and I would, I would do this when I had relationships with, with uh, administrators uh, in, in schools when I was at Vandercook, uh, I would go do a lot of clinics at schools and stuff. And if I happen to have met the principal or administrator, I'd write a note down in my book. I'd put their name. And um, I would just take a business card and I'd kind of write a little note on the back. You know, happen to be here today to work the band. They mm. sound great. You know, hope you're doing well. 
Charlie. And I would just, nice. I said, would you hand this to the, would you hand this to the principal, please? You know, and I think ed reps can do the same kind of thing when they come in. You know, if they've got a business card, staple a piece of candy to it, just write a note, say, hey, stop by today. Your band's doing great. Bill, you know, mm. and give that to the, mm. give that to the administrator. It, it, it doesn't take much, but it's important. So when you have a good relationship with an administrator as an ed rep, what can that do for you? Well, as an ed rep and, and for the business. <laughs> My wife taught home economics. Uh, at, when we moved to Chicago, she taught home economics at a middle school. Okay. And, and it was a pretty good middle school. They had a pretty good band program. And the principal of the middle school, his daughter played the flute, and he loved the band. And the band, the band director was, a, he was a pretty good band director, but he, he had some different ideas. And, and you know, he told the uh, ed rep if these kids can't afford to be in the band then take their instruments back and get them out because we, they shouldn't be in the band this hmm. is the band director talking to the ed rep right the ed rep was smart enough that he had made a relationship with the principal hmm. so the principal told the ed rep you come and see me every time you come to the school so the ed rep would stop by and and the principal's first line to the because because it was a tough school it was, you know it didn't it had it had some poverty in the school, so the principal's first line to the ed rep was like, anybody falling behind in their in their rentals. Huh. And the and the ed rep would go like, well you know so and so or so and so. He says just a minute, and he'd go back and he'd come back, and he gave him a check. He wrote it. He wrote a check. He says just take care of those kids. Those kids are good for the next two months. Just wow. just get on. And he, then he would say, don't tell the band director. He says, don't tell huh. Mr. So-and-so because I don't want him to know. But I want those kids in band because I know how important it is for them. So, wow. so I mean, it, it's a complete role reversal, you know. So I guess if you can establish a relationship with an administrator and you let them know, man, you got some wonderful kids here and you got some kids that, you know, if there's any way that we can find a way to help them. Because every every music dealer is dealing with somebody that's, who has kids that are just a little bit behind in their in their monthly rent payments, right, mm -hmm. for, the, mm -hmm. for the rental. Yeah. If they can do that. Who knows? I mean, sky's the limit on some of those things. Yeah, certainly. Wow. So we're recording this, Charlie, in April of 2021. And the big disruptor of education in the world these days has been COVID. And it's been so massively disruptive to education. No one saw anything like this coming. And we're all trying to do the best we can to react to it and move forward and be proactive and do everything we can to make sure that music education continues and, and is healthy after this is all over. I'm sure you've talked to lots of teachers out there in the field and the various ways they're dealing with this. And I know there are a lot of ed reps who do care very deeply about the health, mental health, and, and just overall um, well-being of their customers, the band and orchestra teachers, and also the health of their music programs. Is there anything that comes to mind that is perhaps a unique thing that ed reps can do to be involved with coming out of this in a healthy way and helping music programs come back in the fall with strength and vigor as they did before COVID even happened. Yeah, hopefully the ed rep has been taking notes on how what's going on in all their districts. You know, this particular district, they didn't start beginners this year. This particular mm. district, they, they tried to start some hybrid, and this is the kind of success that supposedly I'm here and of course those numbers aren't as good as other numbers and this district has done this and so they've got to have this they've got to be this like walking uh, google resource for a huh. lack of better term you know that they know what's going on in the area around them and then when they're working with with directors and especially the the younger directors the directors that are working at the middle or elementary level that are starting those beginners Mm -hmm. You know, it's not going to be the same right away. It's not going to be the same where we can pack everybody in a gymnasium and do a night of rentals and everybody goes. At, so so they've got to think about different ways. And I think engaging those teachers and, and talking about, okay, so, uh, you know, they know what went on this past year. 
You got any ideas on what you're thinking about doing for this year and how can I help you do that? And get them into a conversation and say, well, you know, I was talking to Bob over at this school and they're doing this and Bill did this and he said he tried this and 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 just getting them to think about different ways and then maybe coming up with a with, with a plan A or a plan B or a plan C and, and finding out how they can help get kids involved in band. I've had directors that were going to do spring drive-bys, they called it. And they knew where those kids lived, and they were going to work hmm. with their music dealer, and they were going to going to try to do a driveway audition and get kids. Huh. And so they're, I mean, they're doing drive-bys. That was one way they're doing it. Other ones are, are doing, of course, they're setting up appointments at school. People come in the appointments. Some music dealers are setting up appointments at the store with the director. That the director okay. will be there. There'll be all the instruments sanitized, all of that sort of thing, just to try to protect the health of the kids. But Good idea. I, I don't think it's 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 not going to be the same as it was and probably won't be for a long time. Uh, and, and there have been people that are trying to do recruiting by Zoom and they're trying to do, you know, recruiting by telephone. And, and but it, it again, it's going to I think when you get that face to face time and you get to be with them and they get to touch it. You know, they got to touch it and they can feel it and they can look at it. And you can see the smile on the kid's face when they do it. And every one of, of those, every, every road rep listening, go rent The Music Man again, okay? And, and watch that <laughs> movie because... Great movie. Th- it was a great movie. And there's so much truth to that movie. I mean, there's a little, mm. there's a little shtick to it, but there's so much truth <laughs> in it, you know? It's a matter of when those kids get that instrument in their hand and they touch it and they feel it and there's this hope and they just got that sparkle and I think you can do it and you sounded good and what did you think about this and did you like this better than this and you kind of help direct their thinking and and all of a sudden they start to join band uh, because you know their their friends are in it and again it comes back down to communicating communicating with the, the class that you're you're looking to recruit Let's say that you're looking to do a seventh grade class. You're starting a seventh grade class. Then what you want to do is you want to get your eighth and ninth graders that are in band to, to somehow contact those kids, call them, send them a note. Hmm. Uh, maybe you set up a Zoom call with those kids and you got a couple of those older kids there. Uh, anything that you can do to generate some excitement with those kids about, about joining a band, you know? From a road reps standpoint, I think anything they can do to help the director think through different scenarios and 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 know that it's not going to be the same uh, it's not going to be the same one and done that they've done in the past it's got to be different when ed reps can talk to other ed reps in other parts of the country uh you know i was involved yeah. with with eastman on a couple of things where they brought together some ed reps from different parts of the country and it was wonderful to hear the dialogue and the interchange on that about about ways that different people are meeting the needs of different directors in different locales because as mm-hmm. we know, some have been teaching virtual all year. Some have been hybrid all year. Some have been face-to-face all year. It's just not the same. Sounds like it's going to take some creativity and some tenacity from the ed rep as well as the teacher to recruit a good, healthy batch of beginners for the fall. Yeah, and, and I think the teacher in many cases is waiting for a direction from the administration about what to do. And I, mm. and I think that's the wrong approach. I think... The director has to take and, and be the proactive one and, and initiate the conversation with the principal and said, hey, this has been lost and this is what we need. And this is so how how best can we do this? Right. So the teacher needs to take the lead. That's number one. Number two is that high school directors, whether it's whether it's a band or orchestra, high school directors have got to take an active role in letting their principals, their administration know that by not having a beginning program for a year or the impact that the beginning program has had this past year, is there's going to be a wrinkle at the high school level in a couple of years. So what are right. some things that we can do to help rectify that problem? Right. The, the, so they need they need to be aware of that also. Those those high school directors need to uh, need to try and and you know what are you doing to help in the elementary level? Is there anything I can help you with? Uh, any message that you need me to send down to the elementary level? And if you can get those principals mm-hmm. talking to the principals, if you can get the high school principal talking with the elementary principal, that that's going to be a big help, right? Yeah, makes sense. The, and right. the, the, yeah, and then the other component of that is that classroom teacher. Those, that classroom teacher, whether we pull those kids out of that class for band or for orchestra, 
we've got to be very, very sympathetic to them because in many cases, they will be getting a new class of kids that they've never had before. And, and mm-hmm. now all of a sudden we're going in and we want to steal those kids away from them for band or orchestra. So we've got to develop a really good relationship with, with those classroom teachers. And we have to be sensitive to them and say, okay, you know, you've been through a heck of a lot this year and, you know, you're trying to survive and so am I. So how can we work this out together so that mm-hmm. our kids are the real benefactors in the end? You know, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's like, how can I help you? You know, what can I do to help you kind of thing? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, we all hope that uh, the fall looks a lot brighter than it did in uh, the fall of 2020. And you offered some great advice there, Charlie, and it's very much appreciated. To all the ad reps out there, man, thank you. Uh, Thank you for all those mustard stains you have on your shirt from eating a hamburger in your car in between (laughs) schools. And, And, you know, thank you for just always coming in with a smile on your face and always having a positive thing to say and always be willing to do whatever you can do to help the programs. And I know that many directors, oftentimes you catch them at a time when something's gone on, something didn't go right. They're probably not in the best mood they could possibly be. And they don't tell you thanks enough. But you know, when Mm. I've had conversations uh, had opportunity to have conversations with teachers throughout the years and we start talking we start talking who's your music store and you know what do you like about them and things like that and they all get back and they they love their ed reps you know and i'll close with one one final thing here you know uh, george quinlan who i just love at quinlan Fabish music company uh, has a a contest every year for his teachers and it's like who's your favorite ed rep right who's your favorite ed rep and why right i've seen that yeah mm-hmm. and and I, the winner they get bobbleheads made of the teacher and the ed rep together. And it's just the cool, it's the coolest thing in the world. But he's got this, you know, unique way of like reaching out to his teachers and saying, hey, you know, tell me what you like best about your ed rep because we've got a contest going on. And and so, you know, there, there's just a lot of creative ways to do it. But ed reps, man, you are my you are my heroes. Like I said, you're the American Red Cross for band and orchestra teachers. And, you know, when the disaster strikes, you're the ones we can count on. And please keep on doing it and keep on smiling. Island, and, and we love you very much. Charlie, you just made everybody's day out there. That's great. Thank you so much for your time and your kind words about ed reps and what they meant to you as a teacher and, and what they're doing out there. Shane, it was an honor. See you down the road, buddy. We hope you found the information in this episode useful and something you can use in your everyday life as an ed rep. If there is a topic you'd like to learn more about and have presented on a future episode of EdRep Radio, or you'd like to give us some feedback in general, please email us at edrepradio at eastmanstrings.com. To learn more about Eastman Music Company, go to our website, eastmanmusiccompany.com, or give your Eastman rep a call. Thanks, and drive safe.